Today's video is the second part of my story and today I'm going to tell you about all the things that I screwed up and did horribly in my first year and hopefully save you making some of the same mistakes I did. So when we left off in the last episode I was telling you about how I'd started my first site and how I got to that site and that I had started this composting program and I was running around collecting compost for people and I'd done some bed prep and built a fence around this property and, and more or less got things ready to go into the next season which was the spring of 2010. So what happened when I did that composting program was kind of interesting actually and it was sort of a an unintended consequence in a good way of, of my actions and what happened was I, I was you know giving these compost these buckets these ice cream buckets to all these people to all my friends to get compost from them and some of them ended up working at restaurants and then they told the chefs at the restaurants about what I was doing and so it was this serendipitous way of meeting chefs in a really interesting way and it worked out really well for me. So the first restaurant that I ever started selling to was called Sturgeon Hall and the chef there at the time was very keen on what I was doing and and was a guy who had, you know, environmental values like I did at the time and was was keen to support me and and I started having conversations with him about what are kind of things that he wanted in his restaurant and what I could grow for him that he would use. And so that was the, my first experience selling to a chef and it didn't take too long, even in that season I was selling to another restaurant, actually the Fix Cafe, which was this, was, was a this customer I still sell to today. She was buying greens for me right off the bat and so that kind of got me going with it. And I was selling at farmer's markets, but the thing that I did in my first year, one of the biggest mistakes I made in my first year is I said yes to everybody. So it didn't take long for people to hear about what I was doing and people were really excited about it. It's like, hey, here's this young guy. He'll come and use your yard. He'll do all the work and he'll give you vegetables every day. I had a waiting list that was insane. And, and I said yes to everybody in my first year. I had so many plots. And, and the problem was that I had plots everywhere. Like I, Kelowna is a relatively large, medium-sized town. 140, 180,000 people live here. And I had plots stretching multiple kilometers. And at this point, I was still doing everything by bike. Like I started my farm entirely pedal powered. I had no vehicle. I wanted to do the whole thing pedal powered, so I did. And it was really, really tough. But the logistical challenge was that I had plots all over the city. And I had plots in what's called the South Pandosi area, downtown, or in Rutland. And Rutland is a really further away area. I had plots out. KLO Road and you'd have to know the geography for that to make any sense to you but but they were very spread out and in my first year I was literally spending 10 hours a week or more just pedaling back and forth because because I was doing everything pedal powered I would take buckets of compost from one site and that I, the compost that I made and then pedal it out to a plot spread that compost go back pedal another load like it was ridiculously inefficient and I was doing things like, <laughs> I, was, I remember I was going to get straw for my compost, so I was buying straw from a guy up the hill um, in, in an area called Glenmore, and I would go and I would buy like 14 bales of straw from him at a time, and I'd put it on my bike trailer, and it was insane because it weighed like hundreds of pounds, and I'm biking down the road carrying this stuff, and I still remember the looks on people's faces, how funny it was when they see this Skinny. I was a total bone rack back then. I was very, very skinny, vegan or vegetarian at least. And um, the looks on people's faces were amazing. They were just like in shock because you know you see those old those pictures of people in like a country like Bangladesh that just pile everything up on their bike and ride around like that. That's probably what people thought when they saw me. But in a way, it was a good. It was marketing because it really made me stand out, and people really. Uh, I sort of built this hardcore customer base for like, you're hardcore, I'm going to hardcore support you because you're so dedicated to your farm. And so it worked out really well in that regard. But you know, needless to say, the, the operation was very inefficient because we were pedaling all over the place. The other thing that I didn't do so well either is I didn't specialize my plots well enough and I had 
a lot of the same crops growing in different places. I've always understood the value of doing a mini monoculture to some degree. Like my furthest plot away, I didn't have greens there. I did have like winter squash and onion and stuff there. But I was still in the inner city areas. I was still running around a lot. I didn't I didn't do enough careful planning of where I should put things. And uh and and that that was costly. I mean, one the things that I did, I did I did some things right in my first year. The things I did, the, the the one thing I did really right in my first year is I spent about six months finding all the infrastructure that I needed. And I didn't have all the best infrastructure either. But I did buy a walk-in cooler right off the bat. That was really important, and and I, I'm sure that saved me many hours of suffering. I did buy a BCS walk-behind tractor. I got a used one for a thousand bucks. Got a real good deal on it. And uh, I had some post-harvest infrastructure that wasn't so great, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But so I started with some of the right stuff, and um, you know I was able to make some money in my first year of farming. Right at the end of it, I grossed twenty-two thousand dollars. I had a friend of mine, one friend of mine, who worked with me full time for half of the season. She quit on me in the middle of summer, which left me scrambling like crazy and there was times that I was working you know, 120 hours a week like I barely was sleeping I was just working all the time I barely had energy to feed myself that's probably why I was so skinny back then too but um, but you know I, I grinded it out I did it I got I got through the season um, some things that you know going back to what I said about I said yes to everything so not only did I say yes to everybody who offered me land but I also said yes to every restaurant that talked to me and I said yes to people coming to help me on the farm which I felt like I could really need that help but it didn't really make my life easier it actually just made it more complicated I said yes to everybody who wanted to just show up and have a tour so you know not only was I working all the time but I was constantly showing people the farm and you know I was younger then I was like 30 at the time so I I had energy to just really go full throttle but but I hit a major wall um, one of the things that as far as the farm went that I did really poorly in my first year is I just grew way too many crops like I had you know three different types of onions I had shallots I had garlic I had four or five different types of potatoes I had like geez 10 or 20 different types of tomatoes, I had different types of spinach, I had eight varieties of lettuce, I had so many different crops, I had multiple, I had Easter egg radish, French breakfast radishes, black radishes, I grew uh, watermelon radishes, I grew like so many different types of crops. It was hard to be consistent with anything because it was always something new and you know maybe there was a way that that I marketed that in some ways that maybe chefs liked but it was hard for me to be consistent with things and that just contributed to me really just burning out and I was just always running around like a chicken with its head cut off always trying to catch up so like I never really had a period until the winter that year where I could stop and just look at things and then really think carefully about what to do next. I was always just catching up. I was either going to places to pull out weeds or fixing stuff that needed to be fixed or it's just just always a scramble and that's why keeping things simple is so important but I didn't keep it simple my first year and um, it was it was extremely difficult just to exist as a human like I had I had barely had a social life uh, I, I would try to go out and like hang out with my friends on Fridays and Saturday nights but I would often like I'd have two beers and I would just pass out because I was so physically exhausted uh, one thing I don't do anymore is drink beer <laughs> but but I was still like in my sort of party phase from when I lived in Montreal and bringing that to Kelowna for that year that the, the first two years that I was here it just wasn't sustainable but you know, needless to say, in my first year, I really learned the value of trying to whittle things down and specialize. And I didn't really even understand the Pareto principle then, the rule of 80-20. I just, out of bare necessity, realized that I couldn't make things as complicated as they were. And, you know, the, the, the challenge there, too, is that there was just some infrastructure that I didn't have fully set up. Like, for example, my post-harvesting infrastructure was terrible in my first couple years. I was, the first year in particular, I was, you know, every, I was using the big orange salad spinner. So I was cranking all my greens with that. And that is, 
unbelievably exhausting. If you're doing a lot of greens and you're doing this day in and day out, that's a ton of work. Um, you know, we didn't have the right infrastructure for harvesting. I was ha I was hand harvesting everything. There wasn't a quick cut greens harvester back then either. Uh, in my second year, the, the, the one that Johnny's made came out that was just a blade. I think I used that thing for two weeks and then I, I think it's actually still in my, my shed somewhere. I stopped using it after a week because it was garbage. But um, the the quick cut greens harvest, when that came out, that revolutionized everything. But that I didn't get that until my, I think my fifth year of farming. But um, yeah, it, it was the moral of the story here is that I took on way too much responsibility. I said yes to everybody, and I grew way too many different types of crops and pursue, and tried to pursue way too many types of customers. And so the, the, the shortfalls that I consistently had is that I was over promising and under delivering. And you want to do the opposite. You want to under promise and over deliver. And I think that's what I'm going to leave this one at is that I just took on too much, said yes too much, and I was constantly falling short and disappointing people. And I lost a lot of customers as a result of it too. I could, I, I'd try to take on new customers and say, oh yeah, I can bring you this, this, and this, but then I couldn't. And so I'd lose them as a customer. So that's really where it was after my first year. So in the second video, in the next video, it's actually going to be the third video of this, I'm going to outline all the things that have made my farm a lot more successful in the last seven years after my first year. So I've been doing this for eight years now. So I'm going to take you guys up to today and some of the biggest takeaways with that. We'll see you later.